Grace and peace be with you all. Today we have chosen to use the gospel assigned to the liturgy of the palms as our homily text. Let's welcome in the Holy Spirit to illuminate and enlighten us to these divine words. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. When Jesus and those who followed him drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethany, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find an ass tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on an ass, and on a colt, the foal of an ass. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the ass and the colt and put their garments on them, and he sat thereon. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And we had entered Jerusalem. All the city was in turmoil, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Happy are they who hear these words, believe them, and obey them. character of Christ, our Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ, the head of the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the church, manifest and incarnate in the earth. Speak to us today not as babes or adolescents, but as mature. Feed us not only the bread of thy word or the milk of thy word, but the meat of thy word, that we may become mature sons and daughters of God and manifest your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace be with you all. Well, I miss my community. I miss the fellowship. I miss hugging and fellowshipping and the donuts and coffee afterwards and the energy and the synergy and the hustle and the bustle before service. But I think as Brother Alex told us, we are getting a new download just like 9-11, we never could go into the airport again without walking through a metal detector or taking our shoes off. And if you want to get through quicker, you've got to find a new system to get through there. I believe God is at work in the midst of this pandemic that we are at war with. And I'm not so sure that we can blame it on the dark world. I believe God sometimes does some things and always does things outside of our comfort zone when he gets ready to reveal a greater awakening and greater enlightenment in our lives. I found the gospel very interesting today because it says when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? I believe that we are in turmoil. The whole world is in turmoil, saying, what is this? And so the title of my message today is From Turmoil to Triumph. There is no resurrection without a death. The 
The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus of Nazareth, the very one that is coming. There's a new king coming, a king like it's never existed before, a king of humility, a king that has a different agenda, a king that is going to stare death in the face and become the death conqueror, not a king who is going to command and control his subjects. In this time of global crisis, it seems that reality is revealing itself to us now through great uncertainty and great suffering, which in the Western world we have a hard time understanding suffering and we have a hard time understanding pain. Spiritual awakening is always, in some form or another, an experience of tension and harmony of opposites. It's just like what was said during the meditation today. There's always a tension between opposites. We need them both. Loss and renewal. We need darkness and we need light. We need betrayal and we need loyalty. We need abandonment and we need acceptance. And most of all, we need death and we need resurrection. For there is no resurrection until there's a death. And I prophesy to you today, there's some things that during this time we're going to have to die to do so we can be resurrected into a new perception and a new life. It is time right now of a global disruption. These lessons can help us align with reality. We are being initiated uh, over a little over a year ago, almost two years ago, our men went to Ghost Ranch for a men's rite of passage. And we were initiated, and we were initiated through suffering and pain. We're always initiated through struggle. We always are matured through struggle and pain. And I am very confident there's a silver lining in this whole thing. In the end, God will be glorified, even through this COVID-19 pandemic. And the church remains as a light, the very incarnation of Christ in the earth. As brothers and sisters in Christ, if what we heard in the epistle today, let this mind be in you that was Christ, either we believe we're the body of Christ or we don't. And if we believe we're the body of Christ, we have all authority from God to tread on serpents, to drink poison, and nothing shall harm. Now that does not mean we go out and prove a point and do crazy things, but this is not a time for fear. It's a time to embrace the process, to embrace the process of isolation, to embrace the process of being separated for a while. Because if we, are, if we die in our separation, we'll be more unified when we come alive in our resurrection. Maybe we should call today Turmoil Sunday instead of Palm Sunday. Because turmoil must happen before triumph. Most of us probably hope Jesus will just bring the opposite. We're hoping we'd, we would get peace today or calm or answers to our questions or solutions to our problems. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? And we are asking today, what is this? Turmoil and triumph go together just the way death and resurrection go together, just the way betrayal and acceptance go together. Turmoil sets the tone. For today and throughout the entire week of Easter, which we call Holy Week, it's not our usual understanding of the word turmoil. It actually means commotion and chaos and uncertainty. The whole city was in commotion and in chaos because they were uncertain. What is going on? The Greek word translated turmoil means to shake or quake or be descriptive of disruptive commotion, which happens during an earthquake. Holy Week will be one earthquake after another as we enter into it. The destruction wrought is not the end, but a new beginning. I want to say that again. The destruction, the destruction wrought is not an end, but it's a new beginning. Judas will betray, and his betrayal will reveal our fault lines in us. We will tremble at the intimacy of Jesus' foot washing, saying, wash one another's feet. The earth will quake at the Creator's cross of death. The gates of hell to shudder and burst open. The foundations on which we stand will be shaken this week. The life structures we've built and left in ruin and rubble. 
and old ways of thinking, old ways of seeing, and old ways of acting need to crumble and fall so there can be a resurrection of a new unification. In what ways have we become a prisoner of the very structures upon which we have built our lives? I think those are being challenged in our isolation and in our quarantine right now. We're having to sit and we have to be quiet to think, who have I not forgiven? Who do I have resentment towards? Who do I have, what do I have regret with? Now is a time for contemplation. And that's the death we are experiencing. The turmoil of this day opens the door to triumph, beloved. It is Christ's earth-shaking entry into our world and our lives. When we were at our MROP, we got five instructions for renewal. And they're hard to hear. But I believe the whole world is being initiated. Not just men, not just women, not just children. The whole world is being initiated. Why turmoil before triumph? Because initiation to reality requires a disruption and a commotion in order to have a revelation of something greater. The first revelation is life is hard and difficult by divine design. Life is hard. Turn to somebody in your house right now and say, life is hard. You know what the 12-step program teaches that you must be sick and tired of being sick and tired before recovery can ever begin. You cannot recover and be renewed till you're just sick and tired of being sick and tired. All great spirituality is about what we do with our pain, what we do with our suffering, and what we do with our frustration. We can obey commandments, believe in doctrines, we can attend church services all of our lives and still lose our souls if we run from necessary cycle of loss and renewal. There is a necessary cycle of loss and renewal. Death and resurrection are lived out at every level of the cosmos, but only the human species thinks they can avoid it. <laughs> Even Mother Nature goes through death and resurrection every year. Everything around us says it's a part of renewal. We are very naive about pain and suffering in the West, and especially in the United States. We simply don't have time for it. We try to handle all suffering with our willpower and with our denial and with medication and even with therapy. We have forgotten we do not handle suffering. Suffering handles us. I'm going to say that again. We don't handle suffering. Suffering handles us. Only suffering and struggle can lead us to genuinely new experiences and new perspectives. Everything else is merely the confirmation of an old experience. And that will make us cold and dry. The cross is the central Christian logo. The cross is the central Christian logo, which is the instrument of suffering and death. An obvious message of inevitable suffering, intensely disbelieved by most Christians and most churches because we've had, because we fear it and don't understand it, we've had to preach blessing and favor over suffering, turmoil, and triumph. We are clearly into ascent. We are clearly into achievement and into accumulation of possessions more than we are renewal. The cross has become a mere totem, a piece of jewelry, rather than a demonstration of who we are. We have made the cross into a mechanical and distant a substitutionary atonement. The theory, instead of a very personal intense at one month, we have missed out on the positive and the redemptive meaning of our pain and suffering. We were told it was something Jesus did for us, he substituted it for us. That's what we were told, but that's not the truth. It is something that revealed and invited us into the same process. We're invited into the same process of Christ because we are the body of Christ. We are not punished for our sins. We're punished by our sins. <laughs> by our blindness, our ego our appetites, our desires, and our pride. It seems that nothing less than some kind of suffering will free us or force us to release our grip on our self-serving illusions. 
It seems as though nothing less than some kind of suffering will force us to release our grip, beloved. In this time of suffering, we must ask ourselves some questions. What are we going to do with our pain? What are we going to do with our frustration? What are we going to do with our anxiety? What are we going to do with our suffering? And most of all, what are we going to do with our fears? Are we going to blame others for it? Are we going to try to fix it ourselves? It is the great teacher. None of us want to admit that. But the great teacher is suffering. If we don't transform our pain, we'll transmit it to somebody. I'm going to say that again. If we don't transform our pain into something positive, we will transmit it to others. So number one, life is hard. By divine design, it is hard. And it doesn't sell in the West, but it is eternally a truth. Number two, you're not that important. We are obsessed with self-importance. We are just flat obsessed with our self-importance. We think everything's about us, that our little part is bigger than the whole. Oh God, this is from uh, Rabbi, actually an Islamic prophet, who says, Oh God, if I worship you in fear of hell, burn me in hell. If I worship you in hope of paradise, shut me out from paradise. But if I worship you for your own sake, do not withhold from me your everlasting beauty. Oh my God. It's time we start to worship God for who he is and not for what he does or what we expect him to do. It's time for us to be that light. When we are willing to be transformed, we will stop wasting time projecting, denying, prognosticating, and avoiding our own resistance to change. That's my prayer today, is that we stop resisting change that makes us uncomfortable. Christ, our true spiritual teacher, is not afraid to give us a dose of humiliation. Because the very epistle we read today said, for he humbled himself. If we're going to be like him, we have to embrace humiliation sometimes. If we immediately balk at some other minor blow to our ego, the teacher knows that no basic transformation can happen to us. It takes masterful teacher like Jesus, our mentor, to teach us that we are not as important as we think we are. Now, I know you want a church that tells you just how great you are and just how wonderful you are and just how okay you are where you're at. But a true teacher loves you where you're at but won't let you stay where you're at. And God loves us too much to leave us stay where we're at. We have got to go to the next level. Otherwise, reality itself teaches us. If we don't let him teach us, reality will. And that's a part of the initiation process we're going through worldwide right now. Painful life situations must dismantle us piece by piece. And I know, whether you want to admit it or not, we're all being dismantled piece by piece right now by all of the restrictions and boundaries that have been put on our life. We can blame whoever we want to, but I believe God is working in it no matter what it looks like. Jesus knew that he needed to destabilize a person's false self and separate self before he could understand that they had to find the true self. The destabilizing of our security systems and our ego is always hard to sell. He says, what does it profit a person if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? True prophets deconstruct the ego and the group. That's why the church was scattered in the early church. The priests and pastors reconstruct them into a divine union, and that's why we have the church today. As God said to Jeremiah, your job is to take apart and demolish and then start over building and planting anew. You must take what is old, destroy it, and rebuild what is new. Every parable and every one of Jesus' confounding questions is intended to confront the limitations of our own wisdom and our own power. Most of us will not tolerate it when our false selves are ignored (laughs) or subverted or humiliated. With all of us globally experiencing one common vulnerability to this virus, we can learn the lesson that we are one in our humanity. No one is more important than anyone else. 
Powerlessness is the beginning of wisdom. Powerlessness is the beginning of wisdom. All we can do is pray and allow the flow of the Holy Spirit's presence within us. Number two, you're not as important as you think you are. Number three, (laughs) it's not about me. My life is a part of a bigger plan. Life is not about us, but we are about life. We are not our own. We've been bought with a price. We are a part of an eternal pattern. We're a part of a collective pattern, a corporate pattern of existence. Life is living itself in us. We must not substitute a part for the whole. (laughs) We do not have to figure it all out, straighten it all out, or even do, do it perfectly by ourselves anymore. And I think a lot of people are suffering anxiety when their perfectionism is challenged. You're not perfect. You're not supposed to be perfect. It's in your weakness and your flaws that God is glorified. And God will even transcend those things. True spirituality is not taught. It is caught. We do not have to be God. It is an enormous weight off our backs. All we have to do is participate in the collective process. The reason Christians have misunderstood many of Jesus' teachings is because they did not understand his work as the incarnate example of the Christ teacher of divine life and perception. Jesus' way of educating his followers is intended to position us to a larger life, which he called the Father or we call God. When it is difficult to make clear dogma or moral codes out of Jesus' teachings, many Christians simply abandon Christianity. As a result, we were taught to seek the prize of the future salvation instead of a freedom in the present simplicity of our experience. We have deferred our salvation to a future event. My life is not about me. Turn to somebody in your, in your room right now in your house say, my life is not about me. It's about God. It's about willing participation in the larger mystery of humanity and creation. We do this by not rejecting or running away from the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, but by accepting our current situation and asking God to be with us in it. Why don't we all just right now, wherever you're at, say, God, be with us in this thing right now, because his presence helps us. St. Paul said it well, the only thing that finally counts is not what human beings want or try to do, but the mercy of God is all that counts. Our lives are about allowing life to be done unto us, not doing life. It's about allowing life to be done unto us, which is Mary's prayer, Lord, let it be done unto me, your servant. And it was Jesus' last prayer that said, not my will, but thy will. If we are the body of Christ, if we're Christ in the earth, we do not complain, we do not get into anxiety, we don't hold resentment. We said, not my will, but thy will be done. And that should be our prayer in the end. Number four, you're not in control. Turn to somebody and say, you're not in control. Thinking you're in control control is an illusion. To be in control of one's destiny, one's job, or finance is nearly a moral value in Western society. The popular phrase, take control of your life, sounds mature and spiritual, but it's bogus. It is the fundamental message of nearly every self-help book ever written. Take control of your life rather than give up your life, which Jesus showed us he's going to do this week in his passion. It is the fundamental message of every self-help book that keeps people frustrated. Our bodies, our souls, and especially our failures teach us that we are clearly not in control. As this pandemic is now teaching the whole planet and initiating us all. Not in control of the stock market. We're not in control of, of, of the politics. We're not in control of anything. We're all sitting on pause, letting God initiate us. Learning that we are not in control situates us perfectly in the universe. Mature Christians know they are being divinely guided and their steps are ordered of the Lord. 
being willing to be displeasing to ourselves, listen to this, being willing to being displeasing to ourselves and allowing our ego's needs to take a back seat to the greater good is what it means to not be in willful control. My ego must take a back seat, especially at this time. Especially now, we feel so little control over our own lives and destiny. This lack of control feels like a loss. But there cannot be a renewal without a loss. It feels like a humiliation or a vulnerability. Recognizing our lack of control is a starting point for a serious spiritual walk towards wisdom and truth. And finally, number five, and this is the home run hitter of the five things that help initiate you is you're going to die. Turn to somebody in your house and say you're going to die. The surprises of surprises is that although everybody who has ever lived in the world has died, for some reason we think we won't. (laughs) But you're going to die. The good news is maybe you should die before you die. Because if you can die before you die, the fear of death, the fear of any virus, the fear of any attack, the fear of anything will have no power over your peace. Jesus did not tell us to worship him. He only told us to follow him. We will do that this coming week on our three-day journey through Holy Week. Three days does not mean Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, which is four. It means complete the journey. Three being the number of completion. Three days means going the full journey of death and resurrection. For there is no resurrection without a death. What is it that has to die in you and me and us? It is the way we are truly saved. Death in any form is perceived as a great human enemy. We construct much of our lives to avoid it, to delay it, and to deny it. It seems that we are not ready to die until we have truly lived. It is the people who have not yet begun to live who fear death the most. It is the people who have not learned how to live who fear death the most. They are afraid. And we must be honest, this is where much of America is today on this turmoil Sunday. Death and resurrection are the centerpiece of Christianity. Jesus sought out and admitted to the death and rebirth ritual at his baptism at the River Jordan under the oversight of John the Baptist. Death and life are two sides of the same coin. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot have one without the other. Christianity suggests that the pattern of transformation is not death to be avoided, but death for transformation. Mature Christians submit to trials and learn that only trustworthy pattern of spiritual transformation is death and resurrection. Because Jesus told us we must carry the cross, we must take up our own cross, which is the instrument of dying and being resurrected. I think that we have done a disservice to our culture because we tried to sell Christianity off as some promotion of a better life based on avoidance of process. We must skillfully discern the source of our sufferings. Detach from our expectations, detach from our fears, and detach from all of our resentments and know God's grace is always sufficient for us in all circumstances. Suffering is an enduring and continuing part of being alive. Suffering is a part of being alive. We are sheltered in our own kind of psychological palace somewhere and are shielded from the things like we are facing right now in this pandemic outbreak. We will all face old age. We will all face sickness. We will all face tragedy at some point and even death. One of the most distressing things about the COVID-19 outbreak has been a feeling that things should not be this way. But they've always been this way. We think they shouldn't be, but they've always been this way. We just are so insulated in our little Western palace that we don't understand the struggle and suffering of the whole world. 
And maybe we all ought to open our eyes and realize even in the midst of our quarantine and isolation, we still live like kings compared to most of the world. And complaining and criticism and unresolved anger and unresolved forgiveness is now the time to put it on the altar and let it die so renewal can be born. We cannot avoid these things, old age and sickness and death, but we can remove the unnecessary assumption that things should be otherwise and the psychic pain this assumption causes us. Because your pain isn't physical, it's psychological. It's a fear of something that could happen, but has not happened to you. Exposed and revealed truth about pain, suffering, and even death is no longer a scary unknown for the mature spiritual believer. An unfortunate mistake, something we must change is not the way we think. It's an entryway. This is an entryway into a better life. Eckhart Tolle said, you do not need to be a Christian to understand the deep universal truth that is contained in the symbolic form in the image of the cross. Before such a transformative image, the worst things can become the best things. That cross we see today is a resurrected Christ, the King of glory, but the worst thing is when there was blood on it and his body was pierced. The worst things are intended to become the best things. And we have to stop focusing on the worst things and see and await the triumph out of the turmoil. Facing the reality of one's death is the ultimate encounter with the sacred. I'm going to conclude with this. The ultimate encounter of the sacred is facing death head on. That's what our Lord did. That's what the example of the divine did. He faced death head on. He did not fight against it. And he overcame it by embracing betrayal and abandonment. Judas betrayed him. His disciples betrayed him. Those that called him Hosanna betrayed him. And he even said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Once we are no longer afraid of betrayal and abandonment, we have conquered death like our Lord. Walking through the fear of suffering, death, betrayal, and abandonment brings the freedom to live outside of the head outside of the psychological pain. Death encounters seem to be the primary way to build and rebuild a real life, beloved. Death encounters seems to be the primary method of building a new life. Then life itself, in all of its depth and beauty, becomes the unquestionable gift. So these concepts of renewal, of initiation, that we're going through by this global pandemic that has put us all in the same spot together is an opportunity. Bow your heads with me. It is true life is hard, and yet Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's hard, but he says his burden is light. It is true that you're not as important as you think you are, and yet you do not, do you not know that your name is written down in heaven, in the Lamb's book of life? It is true your life is not all about you, and yet I live now not my own life, but the life of Christ who lives in me. It is true that you are not in control, and yet, can any of you, for all your worrying right now, all your anxiety, all your frustration, add a single moment to the span of your life? It is true that you are going to die, and yet neither death nor life can ever separate us from the love of God. The conquer of death shows us how to face death head on. Turmoil opens the door to triumph. Father, I pray for these, your people today, that we would find peace in your presence wherever we are today. We are not in denial of what is going on, but we are finding you in the midst of it. 
finding opportunities to communicate, to meditate, to connect in ways we've never connected before. And as the body of Christ, we know we are divinely connected incarnately to the source of all life, the light, our God. I pray blessings over these, your people, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us profess our faith in Almighty God.